Let's do it. Audio check on Zoom. Can you hear us? You can type something in the chat if you cannot. I think I got a. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we've reached more or less a steady state. Okay. <laughs> so let me pull up. I mean, we might as well share your screen so we can launch right into it afterwards. this up for you so it doesn't get in the way hopefully okay all right good morning everyone here in the room and also looks like we've got a pretty good number of people on zoom as well um so we're excited to launch our next colloquium of the semester uh today we will be uh listening to professor Ritra mitra who is a uh, assistant professor here in the department of electrical and computer engineering uh, he will be talking to us about collaborative decision making in adversarial environments, fundamental limits, and efficient algorithms. So, a little bit of background about Dr. Mitra. He received his PhD from Purdue University in 2020, and then he was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania from 2020 to 2022. Um, and his research interests include control theory, optimization, statistical signal processing, machine learning, and distributed algorithms. Uh, and before I hand the microphone over to you, I just wanted to make a quick sort of administrative note to the folks that are connected to Zoom. There are uh, two different ways of sort of posting questions. There's the Q&A function and there's the chat function. Uh, if you've got a question that you would like our speaker today to answer, post it in the Q&A and then uh, probably at the end of the talk, we'll kind of go through them one by one and, and make sure that your questions get answered. So with that, I'm very happy to hand over the microphone. Thank you, thanks. <laughs> okay, let me see if yeah, I can- Throw that in your pocket. Okay, can everyone hear me at the end? Okay, so uh, thank you for that introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be speaking in front of this audience. Um, so I work at the intersection of control and learning. Control is the science of taking, of using feedback to take good decisions, good actions over time. And learning tells us how to contend with uncertainty, with randomness in our data. Okay, so this will be a talk that has elements of both control and learning. We'll be thinking about how to take good decisions when we're thrown into completely unknown environments, and when we need to contend with different forms of uncertainty. Okay, before we start thinking about this question, let me... Okay. I thought there was already a question. Yeah. <laughs> soon. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, let me go back to the previous slide for a moment. Uh, uh, so this will be based on a paper that showed up at Europe's last year, and this is the reference for uh, the talk. Okay. okay, so with that, let's dive right in. Um, I usually like to start with examples. So I'm going to paint a little cartoon caricature of the problem of interest to us, and I'm going to use this as a recurrent example to convey much of the key ideas, the key intuition needed to understand this talk. Okay, so this is me, if that wasn't clear enough. Uh, so this is me from a couple of years back when I entered into the city of Philadelphia. And usually when I enter into a new city, the first thing that I ask myself is, what's the best Chinese restaurant in the city? Okay, I love Chinese food, so this is a natural question for me to ask. Okay, if you don't like Chinese food, you could replace this with pizza places, and this would work equally well. Uh, so I asked myself this question, and I realized that, well, there are a few possible restaurants in the city that sell Chinese food. But initially, I have no understanding at all about the qualities of these restaurants. Because that represents the uncertainty in the problem. So then what do I do? I realize that, well, I, could, I should potentially be exploring each of these options. 
And e uh, each time I go and visit a restaurant, I understand a bit more about the quality of that restaurant. And that allows me to take better decisions. These decisions bring me more information. And using that more information, I take even better decisions. Because what am I doing? I'm interacting with an unknown world. The unknown world comprises of these restaurants. And the more I interact with the world, the more certain I become of this world. And that allows me to take better decisions. Because so this is essentially a reinforcement learning philosophy. Now, this exploration that I'm doing, it's not for free. It's coming at a price, right? Because each time I go and visit a restaurant, I need to pay a certain amount from my pocket. And since I'm not a millionaire, well, not at least right now, so each time I visit a restaurant that's not so good, I need to, I, I'm throwing away money, right? So what I'd want to do ideally is to reduce this exploration as much as possible. Now I ask myself, how can I do that? And I realized that perhaps I have friends in this city. And these are not some random pictures that I pulled from the internet. These are actually my friends from Philadelphia. OK, so I, I realized that I have friends in the city. And these people are also exploring the same restaurants as I am. So even without me actually going to a particular restaurant, I know that I can get valuable side information about that restaurant just by talking to these people. And just by talking to these people, by using the information that they have, I can reduce my uncertainty about these restaurants much faster than if I acted just alone. Does that make sense? This complies with intuition. So this seems quite promising, but implicit in this is the fact that I'm making a really strong assumption. I'm assuming that the side information that I get is truthful, it's correct. But in reality, when we deal with really large data sets, it's invariably going to be the case that you have outliers in your data set. So that raises the main question in today's talk. How do we process large data sets where a portion of the data is corrupted and even your clean data is noisy, has uncertainty in it? How do we tell apart statistical outliers from adversarial outliers? That's the central question we want to think about. And in particular, we want to think about this question in the context of decision making. How do we take good decisions when there's uncertainty in the environment we're interacting with? And on top of that, we have to contend with adversarial feedback. Now, before I start thinking about this question, let's pause for a moment. The way I usually think about the problems like I showed you in the last slide is to think about what are the key ingredients in the problem that I can extract out What's the essence of the problem? So that I can ground it in some mathematical framework and reason about it. So what are the key ingredients? Well, it's clearly a decision-making problem because I need to continually take decisions to decide where to go next, which restaurant to pick. It's not just a prediction problem. Okay. The second thing to take note of is that this is a learning problem because there's uncertainty, there's randomness in the qualities of the restaurants. I don't know the qualities of the restaurants a priori. I need to collect data to understand it. Third, there is corrupted data in this setting, and that injects additional uncertainty into the problem. And finally, I'm collecting data from multiple different sources. Because if you think about the previous setting, we have several different agents that are providing me valuable side information. So if we zoom out a bit and think about the big picture, we are essentially looking at the intersection of three different fields. It's a multi-agent system because we have several agents in the system. It's a reinforcement learning problem because we have control under uncertainty. And the third area that I'm going to be tapping into is this area known as robust statistics. Robust statistics is the area where if you're given a bunch of samples and you want to compute some statistics about the data, let's say mean, variance, covariance, this tells us how to do that when there are outliers in the data set. Okay, so we're going to be using some tools from this area. And what I want to do here is come up with principled algorithms that come with provable guarantees. So the key point here is provable guarantees. Okay, I don't want to run a few simulations and just say that, hey, I've just cured cancer. Okay, and the big meta question that I want to think about here is, does more data help us or does it hurt us? 
And this is particularly relevant in the era of big data that we live in, whatever that means. Okay, uh, when we are given a lot of data, your gut instinct would be that the more information that I have, the better it is. What this is saying is that the answer to this question depends. It depends on how you process that information. And that's really the key theme that we'll be thinking about in this work. Now, since this is the first time that I'm probably speaking in front of many of you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little detour and I'm going to tell you about um, I'm going to tell you about how today's talk fits within the broader uh, picture of my research agenda and how it connects to things that I've looked at in the past. Because I want to situate this work within my broader research agenda. Okay, so what do I do? I think about the question that if I'm given different information sources, how do I use information from these different sources? How do I collect it? How do I aggregate it? And how do I process it to solve different types of downstream problems? And these problems could be estimation problems, could be inference problems, could be learning and optimization problems, could be control problems. Okay, so there's a whole spectrum of problems that I'm interested in. And regardless of the specific problem I'm thinking about, the key questions that I end up asking are always the same. When do algorithms for these different problems converge? If they do converge, do they converge to the point I want them to converge to? Or do they converge to something that's meaningless? And finally, what can we say about how quickly these algorithms are converging? Okay, so we don't have the luxury of waiting for infinite iterations. So if you come to me and give me a certain accuracy level that you care about, I should be able to tell you how many iterations it takes my algorithm to run to give you that accuracy. Because so that's what I mean by rate of convergence. And the key tools that I use in my research to reason about these questions are uh, tools from control and areas that are adjacent to control. So optimization, learning, and statistical signal processing. Okay, so this is a very uh, high level summary of my background. And I want to say a few sentences about uh, how I've used this background in the past. Um, one of the main problems that I spent a lot of time thinking about in my research are problems where you want to solve an estimation problem, but the information that you need to solve this estimation problem is spread out over a network. It's not available at any given location. Just think about a really large transportation network or a power grid where you have tons of sensors deployed all over the network. And each sensor at each corner of the network gives you some localized information about that corner. Okay, but if you want to reason about how the overall system is evolving, we need to aggregate information from these different sensors. Okay, so that's the distributed estimation problem. Uh, a lot of people had looked at this problem, but what was unique to our work was the fact that we were able to figure out the minimal assumptions that you need to solve this problem, the necessary conditions that you need on the structure of the network, and the information content available to the agents. And we were able to design algorithms that work under just this, these bare minimal assumptions and nothing more. And as it also turns out, these algorithms are fast, scalable, pretty much all the properties that you would like these algorithms to have. We also looked at adversarially robust variations of these algorithms where certain sensors in the system can be corrupt. They can give you completely garbage information. The other class of problems that I really enjoyed thinking about are hypothesis testing problems, Bayesian inference problems over networks, where once again, imagine that there's a ground truth that takes place somewhere in the world. And this ground truth can, let's say, take place in 100 different ways. Now, each of these 100 different ways is a hypothesis. It's a possibility for what the ground truth is. And initially, you don't know which among these 100 possibilities is the ground truth. And perhaps some guy at some corner of the network can tell you it's not the first three hypotheses. Some guy at some other corner of the network can tell you that it's definitely not the last 10. And essentially, each person can rule out a subset of the false hypothesis. What you want to do is somehow aggregate information to rule out all the false hypotheses. Because that's essentially this problem. And again, there was a lot of work that had gone into exploring this problem. But what was common to all of this work is the fact that at the end of the day, they all relied on averaging beliefs. Okay, so I start out with a belief of the world. I start out with a belief distribution over 
a hypothesis set, which captures what I think is true and what I think is false. I get beliefs from my neighbors and I just average them. And these algorithms converge, but what we realized is that the convergence is extremely slow. So the natural question to ask here is, can you improve upon the rate of convergence? And this is what we showed is provably possible. And the key intuition is that at the end of the day, this is a process of elimination, right? So if I am an agent and I can rule out certain false hypotheses, my beliefs on those false hypotheses will eventually become really low. And I want to be able to propagate those low beliefs on false hypotheses really quickly through the network. And averaging, unfortunately, doesn't do that. Because imagine that you're a really informative person and you're able to have really low beliefs on false things. And you talk to me and I'm unfortunately not so informative and I have high beliefs on false things. Now, if we average, your low beliefs on the false thing goes up. That's clearly not desirable. Okay, so here, what we are able to do is come up with better algorithms that are more informed. Um, another key problem that I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about in the last couple of years is this area of federated learning, which Google came out with in 2017, and it's really picked up since then. Uh, the main premise here is that if you think about our cell phones and tablets, they contain tons of data. So imagine that each one contains images of cats and dogs. What we want to do is somehow combine all of this information to come up with better predictors for cats and dogs. Because that's about it. It's a bit more than that, but this is the core of it. Uh, and really, again, you're asking the question that if I have more information, can I do better with it? Can I exploit it in some reasonable way? And as it turns out, this is also not so cut and dry because there are several challenges unique to the setup. There are privacy concerns, there are communication constraints. Uh, you also need to think about the fact that the data on these different distributions, uh, on these different devices can come from very different distributions. It's a long story short, there are several unique challenges here. And as it turns out, in the face of these challenges, most existing algorithms suffer from a speed accuracy trade-off. What do I mean by that? With these existing algorithms, you'll be able to converge really fast, but you'll converge to something that's meaningless, or you'll converge to the right point, but you'll get there really slowly. Because you're essentially going to trade off speed for accuracy. You can either converge fast, or you can converge to the right thing, but you can't get both. And so this led to the question that, is this a fundamental block? Or can this be overcome if you design better algorithms? And in a paper that I wrote in NeurIPS a couple of years back, I showed that it's actually the latter. If you design your algorithms more carefully, you will be able to provably converge to the right thing, and you will also be able to get there fast. OK, so this is, again, a really zeroth order version of some of the things that I've done in the past. And what really unifies them is the fact that at the end of the day, you're collecting information from different sources, and you're just trying to fit a model that explains the data, that explains these observations. But as soon as you fit the model, that's the end of the problem. You go to sleep after that. OK, so there's no decision making. There is no online aspect to them. There's, there are no moving parts here. Okay, so that brings me to the premise of today's talk. We know that whenever we want to think about large-scale distributed systems, we need to contend with several challenges. Data heterogeneity, imperfect information, communication constraints, robustness, and whatnot. We have a fair understanding of how to address these challenges for the kind of problems that I showed you in the previous slide. Estimation problems, inference problems, learning problems, essentially static problems where there's no decision-making component. But if you think about the same challenges, and ask them for these online sequential problems where there's uncertainty, we know nothing about them. So this is precisely the space that I'm really excited about working on right now. And today's talk will be a little effort in that direction. I'll be presenting about just one theme, um, that of robustness. But there's also concurrent work on each of the other themes. Uh, if there's time at the end, I'll come back to that. So that was all about motivation. Now let's introduce the main formalism that we need for today's talk, 
we are going to be thinking about the simplest reinforcement learning problem, which captures the explore exploit dilemma. These problems are known as multi arm bandits. I'm going to presume you have no background whatever on multi arm bandits, and I'm going to give you all the background that you need to understand the results in this paper. Okay, so let's go back to the same example that I'd shown you at the beginning of the talk. We have a few restaurants. Let's say we have three of them. And I want to figure out which among these three restaurants is the best restaurant. I'll explain what I mean by best in a moment. Now, each time I go and visit a restaurant, I'm sampling an action. I'm thinking about each of these as actions. And as soon as I sample an action, I get some noisy feedback about the quality of the corresponding action, the corresponding restaurant. Why is this feedback noisy? Well, when you visit a restaurant for the first time, do you immediately get to know how good it is? Probably not, right? Because what if the chef had like a fight with their partner on that day, and what you get to see is not necessarily the representative quality of that restaurant. From your own experience, you need to go and visit each restaurant a few times before you gain some understanding about its quality. Right? So that is precisely what we want to capture with this noisy feedback mechanism. Now let's assume that among these three restaurants, there is a clear winner, and let's call that dim sum house for now. Okay. Now I'm going to make this interesting by saying that each time I visit a restaurant that's not dim sum house, I'm going to be penalized by paying a price of one. Okay, It doesn't matter if it's one or some bounded constant. As long as that number is bounded, it's exactly the same thing. So let's just go with one. Now suppose I keep doing this for T days. Okay, so the total number of visits that I make to restaurants is T. What I want to do is I want to sum up all the prices that I pay over this duration of T. I want to divide it by T, and I want to ensure that that number goes to zero as T goes to infinity. Let's make sense of this. Think about every time I go to a restaurant that's not the best one, Think of that as a mistake that I'm making. What am I doing? I'm just summing up all the mistakes that I make in this period of time t. I'm dividing that by t. So that's telling me the average number of mistakes that I make. I want the average number of mistakes to go to 0. Let me pause here and see if this makes sense to everyone. Is this a reasonable metric? Make sense, everyone? Good. <clears throat> So what could be some candidate strategies here? Well, I go to the first place. I like it. I keep going there. That's a possibility, right? Can someone quickly tell me why that's not necessarily a good strategy? Someone who doesn't attend my classes, because I guess I asked this question in my class as well. Why is this not a good strategy? Sorry? Right. So could you elaborate on that? Like, So what if I go to the first place and that first place is not dim sum house? What would happen then? Uh, right. Could someone tell me a bit more, perhaps? What's, the, what's happening here? If I just go to one place and I like it and just keep going there, why is that not a great strategy? Because there is no guarantee that I go to the best place in the first run, right? If I go to a restaurant, an Indian restaurant in Cary, and I really like it, and I just keep going there, I'm depriving myself of the opportunity of exploring restaurants in Raleigh, which could be potentially better. I'm not exploring at all in this, right? It's pure exploitation. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. That's exactly why this is a bad strategy. You need to explore all your options before you make up your mind which one is good and which one's not good. Here I'm saying you go to the first place and you just keep going there. This is precluding the opportunity of exploring other options. So it exactly complies with what you said. I mean, unless I explore, I don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. And I need to leave room open for exploration. Make sense? Good. What's the exact opposite of this strategy? Well, I wake up every day. I toss a three-faced coin. Let's say such a coin exists. 
okay? And whichever side comes up, I go to that restaurant. So I associate each side of the coin with a restaurant. I toss the coin. Whichever side comes up, I go to that place. Is this a good strategy? Is the strategy clear? What? Okay, so there are three restaurants. I associate each restaurant with the face of a coin. I toss the coin. It's Let's say it's a fair coin. So each side has probability one third of coming up. And whichever side comes up, I go to that corresponding restaurant. What do you think? Is this a good strategy? Yeah, nothing exactly. Nothing is guiding me to the optimal solution, right? So let's be even more specific here. Suppose I looked at this ratio. What do you think this ratio will look like on an average? Perfect, exactly, two thirds, right? Why is this two thirds? Because each day I have two third probabilities of exploring the suboptimal options. So over a duration of T visits, on an average, I'll visit the suboptimal of actions collectively two thirds T times. And so if I divide that by T, that number is two thirds. And two thirds doesn't vanish as T goes to infinity. So this is a dumb strategy because I'm throwing away all information from the past. You're violating the first principle in control. You're not using any feedback at all. So all the you know, I mean, information that you've acquired over the past, you don't use it into your decision making. You're just tossing a coin and you're leaving it to chance to guide you where to go. So the main message here is that neither is pure exploration going to cut it, nor is pure exploitation. And what we need to do is somehow balance exploration and exploitation. And this is precisely the main difficulty at the heart of all reinforcement learning problems. Everything cleared up to this point? Yes. So, you know, as stated, your goal doesn't, while you haven't described an approach that achieves the goal, it doesn't seem overly ambitious to, to achieve it. But now my question is, in terms of higher order bounds, uh, how quickly do you approach this extra penalty being normalized, extra penalty being zero? What, what's what's going to happen? Right. So this, as it stated, is vague. I mean, I'm going to make it precise in the next slide because the sum of prices is a random object. So you want to be, you know, you want to understand. Is this happening with high probability? Am I just talking about the mean of these things? Am I talking about like deviations from this? So that is definitely relevant. I'm going to be only looking at the first order moments. So I'm going to be thinking about, if I think uh, about the expectation of this, how quickly is that going to zero? But you might also care about high probability bounds. Okay, and I'll make that precise in a moment. So you could think about deviations around the mean in this case. Yes. Okay, so let's make this precise. And I think Gaur's question will also be addressed in that context. Um, I'm a learner, I'm a decision maker. I'm going to be presented with a finite set of arms. Think of each arm as an action that I can take. And there are K of them. So there are K arms, K actions. Think of each action as a restaurant. The true quality of each action or each restaurant is going to be defined by an object called mu i. Think of this as the mean reward, the true quality of that corresponding action, of the ith action in this case. Okay, so if, if I again think about the restaurant example, let's say Gordon Ramsay decides to rate restaurants from one to 10 in some based on some score, mu i would be the score of restaurant i. Higher values imply better restaurants. At each time step, I'm going to pick an action from this action set. And upon picking that action, I'm going to receive as feedback a reward. What is this reward? It's the sum of the true mean, the true quality of that restaurant, plus some noise. Okay, so this noise is precisely what adds randomness to the problem. By the way, it should be obvious to you that if there is no noise, this is a trivial problem, right? Because the first time I go and visit a restaurant, I'll immediately get to know what the true quality of that restaurant is. So upon exploring each restaurant just once, I will know what the best restaurant is. There is no need for me to balance in exploration or exploitation. Okay. So it's precisely the noise in the problem that makes this non-trivial. Okay, so at each time t, I pick an action from this action set. 
what do I get to see? I get to see a perturbed version of the true quality of that restaurant. What is the perturbation? It's really benign perturbation. It's zero mean Gaussian noise. You can have funkier noise sequences here, but that won't make the problem any more interesting than it is right now. Okay. What is our objective? So this is where I'm going to be formal now. Our objective is to minimize an object called the cumulative regret. Let me unpack this object. First, let's define by mu star the maximum of these mu i's. Okay, so this is the mean reward, the true reward corresponding to the action that has the highest mu i. Okay, so this is the best thing that I can hope to get. Now, what is mu star t? If I knew the best action ahead of time, I would just keep going there. And over a duration of time t, what is the total reward I would gather? I'd gather mu star times t. Okay, so this is the best reward collectively that I can hope to achieve. What do I subtract off from that? I'm summing up all the rewards that I actually get to see based on the actions that I take. And I just take an expectation of that object. Okay, yes, good. I, I need to not, I don't want to nitpick, but this is different from what you said earlier. So earlier you said, your motivating story. Yes. I have three restaurants. Yes. Give some is definitely better. Uh -huh. When I don't choose it, uh, I pay a penalty of one. Now the current formulation, mm -hmm. you know, it could be that, you know, your top two restaurants are separated by epsilon. Mm -hmm. So not choosing dim sum could actually be, you know what, whatever, un unimportant. So saying saying that you have a constant penalty is different from this formulation. No, it is exactly the same, right? I mean, if I put the mu star t inside the expectation, what's the gap between those two objects? I can just write it as expectation summation mu star minus mu i t, right? Think of that as like a price. That's the mistake. In, in the previous example, that number is bounded by one if I don't choose the best restaurant. In this case, it could be some delta. I could replace it by a delta, and that would exactly be the same thing. So as long as dim sum is definitely the best by a margin, not a problem. But if dim sum is epsilon be better than Finn's no, but, restaurant, yeah. and Finn's restaurant is obviously 10 million times better than my restaurant, then you know, as long as you go to dim sum or Finn, you're cool. Obviously, no, 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 no not really. Because, no, because yeah. even if you go to a restaurant that's really close to the best one, right? It's not exactly the same. So you pay a gap, even if it's epsilon, but that epsilon is going to build up over time, right? It's getting multiplied by T. So even if there is a finite gap, however small that is, that will get amplified by the fact that you're doing this over a horizon. So it gets multiplied by T. And unless I do something about it, if I divide that by T, that number still remains epsilon. It doesn't go to zero. So let's suppose that there are just two actions. And like Grad said, these actions are extremely close to each other. And the question is, if I go to the one that's not the best, do I pay a price? Yes, you do. Because if the gap between them is epsilon, and epsilon is not zero, each time you go there, you pay a price of epsilon on an average. And if you do this for t iterations, the total price that you'll pay is epsilon t. And if you divide that by t, you still pay a price of epsilon. That doesn't go to zero as you increase t. Yes. I just have a question. So, how do you compute the cumulative regret if I mean, you don't know mu star beforehand? I mean, no, you're not computing it. Yeah. So, I don't know what this is as the learner. I'm saying that this is my objective. I can try to minimize an objective without knowing what it is. So, I don't know what mu star is. This is my benchmark. My strategy doesn't know what mu star is a priori, right? But let's say you are someone who knows mu star ahead of time. I'm trying to compete with you. You are a clairvoyant savant who knows what the best restaurant is ahead of time, and you keep going there. The maximum reward you can hope to get in that case is mu star t. I'm just trying to compete with you without prior knowledge of what the best action is. Constants that don't matter in the uh, could you repeat that? Like the constant and, uh, so, 
Yeah, so basically, uh, I think what you were saying is that you want to minimize RT and you just move them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. You could, you could. Yeah, this doesn't make any difference at all to the problem formulation. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because this doesn't, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you could move it inside too. But the point is that you don't need to know what this is really. Okay. No, but you're not this. So this is not an algorithm where you know this ahead of time and you're going to do gradient descent on it. You don't know the objective function. And that's completely fine. Even without you knowing the objective function, I can still define a valid objective function. Right? You just don't know how to minimize it ahead of time. But that doesn't take away the possibility of defining an objective function. This is the metric that I want to minimize, but I just don't know how to minimize it. You're familiar with linear quadratic control, right? So let's say you want to do this. You don't know the A and the B. That doesn't preclude me from defining this as an objective. I'm telling you, minimize your LQR cost. And I'm telling you, OK, you don't know A and B, but maybe learn it over time to minimize it. Does that make sense? OK. So all I'm doing here is adding up these regrets over time. And why do I call it cumulative? Because I'm adding things up over time. Why do I call it regret? Well, I'm regretting the fact that I don't know the best action ahead of time. If I did, I'd be playing this all the time. And I don't know this, so I don't play this all the time. So I play what I play, I add it up, I take the expectation of it, and I compare it to the best thing that I could hope to get. And what do I want? I want to play a sequence of actions so that RT divided by T goes to 0, exactly like we did in the last slide. I want the average regret to vanish. Now, why do I take an expectation here, just quickly? Because the object inside the summation is actually not a deterministic object. Why is it not deterministic? Because the actions that I'm taking right now depend on things that I've seen in the past. But the things that I've seen in the past are precisely these rewards, these observations. But if you notice, these observations have randomness in them. So my actions inherit randomness from the observations that I've seen in the past. And hence, these mu i's depend on these actions, clearly. So hence, they're random. Okay, And I guess the, the question that draw raised, instead of an, defining this as an expectation, I could keep it as is. In that case, RT would also be a random object. right? I could try to you know, do things like, with high probability, I want RT over T to go to 0. So instead of an expectation here, I could also try to give high probability guarantees variations around it and whatnot. But this is the simplest formulation that we can think of. Is this clear? It's instructive at this stage to just think about how this differs from a standard prediction problem or a supervised learning problem. Okay? The key distinction, the first key distinction is the fact that Unlike a supervised learning problem, no one comes to you and gives you a training data set ahead of time. You collect your own data by interacting with the world, and the data comes in online in a sequential manner in real time. That's the first distinction. The second key distinction that makes this highly non-trivial is the fact that your observations are heavily correlated over time. Why are they correlated? Well, let's suppose that this Friday, I go to a restaurant and I really like it. That's going to influence me going to the same restaurant in the future. So when I do go to that restaurant in the future and I see certain rewards, they're influenced by the fact that I went there in the past and saw some rewards. So if I want to phrase this, the current actions that I take depend on the past rewards. And these current actions will also give me future rewards. So in that sense, the future rewards are heavily correlated with past rewards. And the rewards are precisely the observations in this problem, the data in this problem. Is this clear why the data is correlated over time? This is very different from a supervised learning setting where all the data you assume comes IID independently from some distribution. 
that this correlation makes things really uh, complicated here. The third thing that needs to be taken into account is the fact that you only get to see the rewards for the actions that you take. You don't get to see the rewards for the actions that you don't take. Right? And moreover, unlike learning, uh, let's say a prediction problem or a classification problem, where you're given labels ahead of time, that these, you know, these are bad data points, these are cats, these are dogs, there are no labels in this problem. No one tells you ahead of time that these could be bad restaurants, these could be good restaurants. You discover that on your own by interacting with the world. So again, we come back to the same thing. We need to explore to try out new things, and we need to exploit to use past information. Okay, so these are the challenges with the basic multi arm bandit problem. We are going to be looking at a slight generalization of this problem called the linear stochastic bandit problem. Why do we look at this? Well, if you think about really large reinforcement learning settings where you have lots of actions, it's going to be impossible for you to explore all of these actions. So what you're ideally hoping for is that if I go and explore a few actions, they should reveal information about the other actions. So we're essentially hoping for correlations between the actions. So we want a tractable way to model such correlations. And linear bandits are the simplest formalism that give you these uh, correlations. And these are, in fact, used in pretty much all the recommendation systems that you see. Amazon recommendation systems, Netflix recommendation systems, and whatnot. So in this case, what's the action set? It's, again, a set of k options, k actions. But each of these actions is a vector that lives in d-dimensional space. Now, you're a learner. You're going to play an action from this action set, and you're going to observe a reward, yt, exactly like before. You pick an action, you get a reward. But what's different from the previous setting is that your reward model is structured. It adheres to the structure where if I play an action at, the reward that I get to see is the projection of that action onto some unknown latent model theta star. Okay, so this model is unknown to you ahead of time. And you should think about theta star inner product AT as the true mean, the true reward of the action that you play. And again, this gets perturbed by noise. Yes. I have a question. So the thing is like, where are you using that context from your friend? So you have to talk about contextual values. Yes. But in, in combination, I'm using that context. You're not mapping that context to the reward. Okay. Yes. Good, good question. So contextual bandits are even harder than this. This is an easier version of the contextual bandit problem where, let's say in a contextual bandit problem, you're a user, okay? And I'm the decision maker. What I want to do is show you a certain number of ads on our ad uh, web page, and I'm going to see which ads you click. If you click the ad, I get a reward of one. If you don't click it, I get a reward of zero. So how do I do that? I try to do that by trying to figure out your features those features would be embedded inside this vector theta star. This would be a high dimensional vector. Each dimension of that vector, a vector will try to capture some information about the user, maybe the age, maybe the demography the information, maybe the race, whatnot. And what you'll try to do is align the ads that you show with the preferences of that user. Okay, and this alignment is captured by the inner product. Okay, so that's the version of, that's the contextual bandit setting. It's even harder than this because the feature vectors that arrive are actually time varying. Here, I'm assuming that you have a fixed feature vector, which is theta star. It's even easier than that. Uh, professor, in your problem setting, um, are all the agents um, given the same actions or do, can they take different actions? In we'll come to that. So I'm, I'm not even going into the formulation in our problem right now. I only have one agent right now. Oh, okay. So we'll come to that in a moment. I'm just setting up the background for that. Yes. D is like a, okay, so D is the dimension of the problem. So you have vectors that live in RD, reals D dimensional vector space. So D is the dimension, D is this dimension. A vector. A, an action is just a vector. So in this case, an action. Right. So it could represent, let's say, like in the ad placement problem. The user's features are characterized by theta star. So let's say age, race, whatnot. The action, I mean, if let's say this is a movie 
problem. The actions, the features of the actions could be, let's say, is it an action movie? Does it have like 10 songs in it? Does it have Arnold Schwarzenegger in it? Things like that. Okay, so those could be your features. And you try to align that with the features of the user. Okay. Now, why is this modeling correlations? Notice that even when I play two different actions, the rewards that I get to see are related by the fact that they're both projections onto the same object. That object is theta star. So even when I play a certain action, let's say A1, I can still make some deductions about the reward that I'd see if I played A2 via some estimate of this parameter theta star. Okay, so in particular, if I knew theta star ahead of time, I can know what the rewards are for playing all the actions ahead of time, right? Because I just project the action onto theta star and I know what the reward is. But the key point here is that if I'm able to estimate theta star, that will reveal information about other actions as well. This structure was not there in the multi -arm, basic multi arm bandit problem, where playing one action reveals no information whatsoever about the other actions. But this immediately makes this. Yeah, adversarial, right? <laughs> No, it wasn't me. I'm not upset that you picked the wrong restaurants. <laughs> yeah, I think I was penalized for something, right? I picked the wrong restaurant, and yeah, this is just like there's no one like yeah. This is a huge regret. Things they did some house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so the main thing that I want you to take note of here is that everything is pretty much the same as before. It's just the fact that the rewards are given by this kind of an inner product structure. That's really the main thing to take note of. Now, I'm going to define regret in pretty much the same way that I did before. The only thing that changes is the definition of the best arm. What's the definition of the best arm? I look over all the actions that I have, and I look at the action that's most aligned with theta star. Why is this the best action? Because this gives you the highest inner product. Right, so that's about it. And what I do here is exactly what I did before. Theta star, A star is the highest reward that you can hope to get. Summed up over T iterations, that would give you theta star, A star times T, like we had before. But if you just look inside the summation, at each time t, theta star a star is the highest reward you can hope to get, and theta star a t is the reward that you actually get. The difference between them is the instantaneous regret that you suffer for not knowing the best action ahead of time. You sum them up, you get your cumulative regret. Okay, Theta star a star is the highest reward you can hope to get. Theta star a t is the actual reward you get. The difference between them is the regret that you suffer at time t. Add them up, you get your cumulative regret. Okay, and this is what we want to minimize. We want to ensure that RT divided by T is again going to zero. So it's pretty much the same definition as before. It's only the reward structure that's changed. Uh, let's skip history. I mean, well, I did download this picture from Google Images. So I guess I owe it to myself to say a, a couple of sentences about this. Um, the main thing that I want to just touch upon is the fact that bandits have been around for some time. So it's been almost 90 years uh, since it's been around. But the term bandit didn't really show up in this early work by William Thompson. He was looking at medical trials. It seems to be synonymous with one lever slot machines, like the ones you see if you go to Vegas. So if you think about casinos with like slot machines, think about like maybe this is me, you know, I've like confronted with like two slot machines. I pull the le lever, I get some rewards. Okay, so what I want to do is maximize my winnings. I don't know the qualities of the two slot machines ahead of time. 
I interact with them to maximize my rewards. That's sort of the idea here. And uh, from an academic perspective, uh, you know, bandit models have been studied a lot because, again, they're the simplest problems that help you to capture this fundamental dilemma between exploration and exploitation that you face when you have uncertain options. Um, I just want to quickly say that these models, you know, beyond being of just academic interest, they've been used in all sorts of uh, applications. Think about ad placement problems. Um, you know, you're the decision maker. You decide what ads to show on your web page. A user comes. If they like the ad, they click it. If they don't like the ad, they don't click it. And that gives you some rewards. A reward could be plus one or zero. And based on that, you decide which ads to show next. It's the same with recommendation systems. If you're Netflix, you're trying to show, you know, for each user, you want to figure out which movies to display on the browse page. If the user likes it, they watch the movie, they rate it positively, and based on that, you again readjust which movies to show. And finally, you can do the same with dynamic pricing. Okay, so you set a price for a product. If the user likes it, they buy the product, you get a plus one. If they don't like it, you get a zero, and based on that, you readjust your prices. Okay, so the overarching point here is that, and I mean, these models do make sense in, yeah, good. Does the problem get harder if they're always negative? Um, not really, I don't think it does. No, I don't think it's gonna make a difference. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's about all the background you need to understand the results in uh, the paper. So let's start formulating the problem of interest for us. Um, in our setting, we have M agents. All of these agents interact with the same linear bandit model. Okay, and they can exchange information via some central server. Now the observation model for each agent I is exactly the same model that I'd shown you earlier. Okay, so the reward for agent I at time T is the inner product between some unknown latent parameter, theta star, the action taken by agent I at time T, and then again, you have some additive noise. Then the key thing to note here is that it's the same linear bandit model that every agent is interacting with. It's the same theta star that shows up for every observation model, and it's the same set of actions that every agent is exploring. I guess that answers your question, Finn, right? I mean, this is probably what you had in mind. So in, in the context of the, yes. Um, but every agent um, has the same set of actions, right? The same set of actions, yes. So think about this as your city. All of these agents get to explore the same restaurants in the city. It's the same set of restaurants, the same set of actions. Now intuition dictates that if these agents were to exchange information, given that they're all exploring the same set of actions, they should be able to reduce uncertainty about each action much faster than if they acted alone. Does that sound intuitive enough? Right. Basically, what I'm thinking is that, well, if this is a noisy observation model, if we exchange information, we should be able to reduce the variance of this noise model. That's the key point. But where this intuition breaks down is from the specific challenge in our setting. We're going to assume that a small fraction, let's say an alpha fraction of agents are adversarial, and we're going to allow them to act arbitrarily. Okay, so we don't have any control over what these agents are going to do. The only thing that we're going to control is the fraction of adversarial agents in our system. But you, of course, don't know which of these agents are adversarial ahead of time. So then the key question that we want to ask here is, can collaboration still help? And if so, what would be the fundamental limits in terms of the collaborative performance gains that you can hope for in this setting? So again, in the context of the restaurant problem, think about people exploring restaurants, going home, writing reviews. Reviews are uploaded to some web recommendation server. And if I'm one of these people, I'm asking myself, do I stand to gain if I read the reviews on this online website? That's the side information here. What's the performance measure? I'm still going to care about regret, exactly the same definition that I showed you but I'm going to be thinking about this regret for each good agent I. Now, what's a very natural strategy that you can adopt? Suppose I'm a person in the city, and I know that online reviews can be garbage. 
So then what can I do? I can just act alone, right? I don't look at these reviews at all. I just explore and exploit on my own and try to you know, I mean, figure out what the best restaurant is. I could do that. That's a very natural strategy. And if you did do that, and if you followed the optimal bandit strategy in that case for a single agent, the regret that you'd get is O tilde square root dt. Okay, so by O, I'm just hiding universal constants. I only care about the dependence on the dimension of the problem D and the horizon T. Now notice that if I divide this object by T, that number will go to zero, right? Square root D over square root T goes to zero as T goes to infinity. So even without talking to anyone else in the world, I can achieve average regret that goes to zero. But the question that I want to ask is, can I do better? Can I make it go to zero faster? Yes, that's really the dilemma. So there is a tension here. Collaboration is giving us hope that we might be able to improve upon this bound, but it's also telling us that if we don't act carefully, if we just do this naively, then we might end up not learning anything at all. Yes. Make sure I understand the regret here, which is proportional to square root of t, is R t. And, and, and earlier, when you said I want to normalize by t, here you didn't normalize. It. No, this is this is just R t. Okay. So this is the this is the cumulative regret. It's not the average regret. Correct. So if I divide this by t, I'll get the average regret. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure. No, no, that's that's a good good point. Yes. So this is the cumulative regret. This is R t as I've defined it. If I divide this by t, I'll get the average regret, which clearly goes to zero in this case, right? Because you get square root d over square root t. So this again brings me back to the question that I raised at the beginning of the talk. Does more data help or does it hurt in this case, given that a portion of the data is corrupted? And there's really no understanding of this question for this kind of a sequential problem. So that brings me to uh, the main contributions of this work. The first thing that we do is come up with a new algorithm, a robust algorithm that, well, it doesn't really matter what we call it. Let's just call it RCLB. Um, this algorithm rests on a few different ideas. The first idea is phased elimination, where we're going to start out with a candidate set of potential best actions, and we're going to gradually prune that set over time. And think of this as like a, faculty candidate elimination process where you start out with a huge pool of candidates and you gradually narrow down. And uh, I just looked at draw to see if you'd agree with this, but <laughs> anyway, so uh, there's also distributed exploration. We're going to split the exploration among the agents. And really the key ingredient here is going to be the design of certain robust confidence intervals. Okay, so these would be confidence intervals uh, centered around the estimates of the means for the arms. And these intervals will be slightly more inflated than what they would be if there were no attackers. The reason for this inflation is that it gives us a bit of slack to account for the additional uncertainty injected by the attackers. And as it turns out, this the construction of these confidence intervals needs to be really delicate. If they're too aggressive, to, if they're too tight, you can rule out the best action really quickly. And if they're too loose, then again, you pay a large price in terms of regret. And that's about the extent of the algorithm that I'll be able to cover in today's talk. So if you have more questions about this, I'll be happy to chat offline. But let me at least tell you the main performance result for this algorithm. Suppose the fraction of adversarial agents is less than a half. If it's more than a half, then you really don't have anything to do because the good agents would be in minority, the bad agents would be in majority. Can't really do anything in that setting. So if alpha is less than half, what we can show is that with high probability, the regret of each good agent is going to be bounded above by this object on the right. Okay, so again, I'm showing you not the average regret, I'm showing you the total regret, but you can just divide this by t to see what the average regret would look like. And what, what do I mean by high probability? I mean that you can give me any failure probability that you want. Let's say you can give me a 0 0.01 probability delta, and this result would hold with probability 0.99. Okay. So let's unpack this object on the right, and let's see what it has to tell us. The first thing to note is that square root dt was the regret that I would get if I just acted alone. I can reduce that number up to this additive alpha term by a factor of square root m. 
what was M? M was the number of agents. So this is saying if there were no adversaries in the system, I would be able to reduce the regret by a factor of square root M. And that is precisely capturing the benefit of collaboration. But then I've decided to participate in a system where I know that there could be attackers, uh, there could be corruptions. So I need to pay some price for that. And the price I pay is this additive term, which captures the effect of corruption. Okay. So what this is really saying is that if alpha is small, then there is significant incentive to using this algorithm because you will benefit from collaboration, even though you have attackers in your system, you have worst case uh, adversarial agents in your system. Now, if alpha is zero, then this bound would be optimal in all the relevant parameters, D, T, and M. The only thing that we need to understand is whether this additive effect of the alpha, is it just an artifact of our analysis or is it fundamental, is it inevitable? So that leads to the second main result. What we argue is that it's in fact the latter. It's unavoidable. Okay, so given any policy, no matter what you choose to do, I will always be able to come up with at least one instance of our problem where you will suffer a regret that is at least alpha square root t. So there will be a dependence on alpha that's inevitable. And you can't kill it by just increasing the number of agents in your system. No matter how many agents you have in your system, this term will always persist. And what do I mean by an instance of a problem? In our case, an instance is just defined by the means of the arms. Okay, so let me just think about a simpler problem here. Let's say you want to do mean estimation. Let's say you have a Gaussian distribution with known variance. Let's say the variance is one and the mean is unknown to you. I give you a few samples from the distribution and I tell you, give me an estimator for the mean. Okay, so let's say you come up with an algorithm. On Wednesday, I give you an example where the true mean is five. On Thursday, I give you an example where the true mean is 10. You can't tell me that my algorithm does well when the mean is five and it fails miserably when the mean is 10. So when I think about algorithms, I want to think about all possible instances of the problem. In the mean estimation problem, instances are defined by the values taken on by the unknown mean. In our case, instances are defined by the means taken on by the arms, the true means of the arms. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that I'll be able to construct at least one instance of our problem where no matter what strategy you play, no matter what algorithm you apply, this regret bound is unavoidable. Okay, so if you combine that with the previous result, what it says is that this is unavoidable and overall our bound is near optimal. Can't really do much more better than that. Let me pause here and quickly ask if the results make sense. Okay. Um, in the last two to three minutes, let me quickly just situate this result in the context of what people have looked at in the past. Uh, the first thread of literature that's very relevant to this work is this area of robust statistics where, as I said, I mean, let's say you're given a bunch of samples from some distribution. You want to compute statistics about that sample set, let's say the mean, the variance, and whatnot, but a certain fraction of samples in that data set are outliers. Okay, so robust statistics tells you how to still compute reliable estimates of means and variances and whatnot when you have corruptions in a data set. And this work, this line of work was pioneered by Huber and Tuke in the 1960s. And there's much more recent work by Gabo Lugosi and Mendelssohn. Okay, this is definitely not an exhaustive lift, list. This is just an, I mean, a representative set of samples here. The, the other uh, thread of literature that's really relevant is uh, literature that looks at outlier robust distributed optimization. I'm thinking about supervised learning and stochastic optimization synonymously because you can pretty much write down every supervised learning problem as a stochastic optimization problem. And again, in this context, there's a lot of work. Uh, so this is just, again, one representative paper by Peter Bartlett and Kanran Ranchandran at uh, UCB. And um, you know, the, the point here is that if you think about both these threads of literature, they're still looking at static problems, one-shot problems, where you collect data, fit a model, and that's the end of the problem. There is no sequential aspect to them. There's no online aspect to them. 
So in that context, our work is the first to look at outlier robust RL, collaborative RL. But we haven't really changed the world with this result. We're looking at the simplest possible bandit setting, which is the simplest RL problem. There's a huge spectrum of problems that remain unexplored. And this is just a little effort in that direction. Okay, so what did we do today? We, uh, we talked about an algorithm. Well, we didn't really introduce the algorithm, but you need to trust me that there exists an algorithm in this paper that provides you near optimal regret bounds. Uh, again, you need to trust me that it's computationally efficient, meaning that you can implement it. And the other good thing about this algorithm is that it's really communication efficient. Meaning that if I think about t iterations, you only need to communicate log t times. That's really nothing. And that's extremely important in the context of these uh, large scale settings where communication is a bottleneck. Um, there are a bunch of extensions in the paper. I think someone asked about contextual bandits. So I think you can check out the paper. It does look at the case where the feature vectors that arrive are time varying. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that. Uh, well, uh, four minutes left. Um, let me just say that um, uh, you know, I mean, what I did today was only think about the robustness theme. There are a bunch of things that I'm also looking at at the point at this moment. Communication is one of them. So, how do we design RL algorithms that are communication efficient? What's the minimum amount of information that we need to exchange to achieve certain performance bounds? Um, the robustness theme is another challenge that I'm really interested in. Um, so, you know. If, I guess you've all seen this example where you take a panda, you perturb a few pixels, and you get a gibbon. But that, does that really bring us any close to un, you know, closer to answering questions about, again, these decision-making problems, where let's say you have an autonomous car, you want it to go from point A to point B without colliding with obstacles. How does the car operate? It takes in images of the world, it you know, I mean, processes them, and then decides whether to break left, right, move forward, move back. Those are your actions, right? So this is clearly a decision-making problem. It's not just a classification problem. And what I want to understand is, if the images that the car sees to make its decisions are perturbed, how does that affect long-term decision-making? That's the key question that I want to understand. And the last theme that I'm very interested in is, you know, let's suppose you have two different agents, each acting in different environments. And I tell you that this agent learns to safely operate in environment one. And I tell you that the next environment is quite similar to this original environment. And they take the robot and they throw it into this new environment. Because if the two environments are similar, I should be able to extract some information about what I learned about acting safely in the first environment. Yes, and how can I use that to quickly reduce the sample complexity of learning to act safely in the second environment? So in layman terms, if I learn to play cricket in, let's say, Bangladesh, can I do well in India? Something like that. Okay, so I think about these as like two, as these two countries, two environments. So that's really the key idea here. We're thinking about transferring knowledge across different Markov decision processes. So I'll just stop here by saying that there are a bunch of different uh, themes here that we could potentially explore. And you know, I mean, we're pretty much scratching the surface here with multi-arm bandits. There's a huge space of unexplored problems from MDPs with finite state and action spaces to your LQR problems with continuous state and action spaces. Okay, so unknown themes, unknown problems here, and you can trade off all of these, uh, you can think about all of these questions. Algorithm design, sample complexity analysis, and uh, fundamental trade-offs. Okay, looks like I have two minutes to go, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the optimal design, yeah. I'll, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. I think we're at the end yeah. of this session, but maybe it's time for one question from the audience here and one from Zoom as well. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, of course. I'll, I'll, does anyone have a question in the room? It was very interactive, by the way. Oh, okay. okay. Questions on the uh, anyone, anyone have a question? Okay, he wants to come up and ask. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, yes. What about the time that Bambi sees in the past? Like, like if it has not finished that down, Bambi often will read it. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So, contextual bandits model that. Because the feature vec vectors change over time, the optimal action also changes over time. 
So like if you look at the paper, we do look at that setting where the optimal action may not be the same across time instance. It could potentially change over time. Yes. It just makes it harder. I wanted to present it for the simplest setting. That's a good question. And uh, maybe we can do one of the questions here. Yes, too. yes. So yes. if you don't mind reading it, maybe it's a reference. Should UI be a random variable as a function of time? Um, it's harder to do that. So I don't want to make the... Um, yeah, uh, you could, but that would make the problem much more harder. It would make it a non-stationary problem if the true statistics of the random actions also change with time. So that, that would make it much harder. I don't even know if there's any work at all and like non-stationary bandits. So it's it's definitely an interesting question. And I guess if the, if the non-stationarity is not too bad in the sense that if the mean is not changing drastically, then you could still potentially do something. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's doable, but definitely harder. That's a great question, by the way. Yeah. So I think probably for the sake of time, we'll wrap up. I know a lot of people have already sort of stepped out already. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. But uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate right. you making it very interactive along the way. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Just go right through. Oh, yeah, yeah. You actually uh, took questions. Yeah, that's, that's that. So. No, no, I mean, that makes it more interesting. So, yeah. So. <laughs> well, thank you once again. I appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, but there's a question here. Feel yes. free to walk up and interact with our speaker. Uh, I have one question yes. regarding your formulation. Yeah. And then I have another question regarding yeah. my research work. Which I have. Okay, let's, let's do the easier one first. Yeah. Your formulation. So, regarding the formulation, 